Hi, good afternoon. My name is Mike Ledson. I'm a diplomat at the U.S. Embassy Branch Office in Tel Aviv. And we are sitting here today in the American Center in Jerusalem for a discussion about religious freedom. This is the second discussion in our series on religious freedom, which began marked off with the October 27th International Religious Freedom Day. Now, I am uh, joined today by two experts on religious freedom. Uh, I am honored to introduce you to. Uh, the first is Andrew Henry, who is a PhD candidate from the Boston University Department of Religion. He's also a faculty member at the Religious Freedom Center in Washington, DC, and he's the founder of Religion for Breakfast, which is a YouTube channel dedicated to educating the public about the world's religions. And I'm also honored to be joined here today by Yair Shelley who is a senior researcher at the Israel Democracy Institute. He's a journalist, author, and publicist, and he studied the religious Zionist world for many years. He's currently a member of the editorial board of Makor Rishon and the author of a weekly column there. And in 2000, he published his book called The New Religious Jews, Recent Developments Among Observant Jews in Israel. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, so, in our first discussion, which was a few weeks ago, and is still available on our uh, Facebook page and uh, website, is uh, you know, we, we talked about what is religious freedom, and we talked about the, uh, the history behind it, we talked about what religious freedom is, what it is not. Uh, I'd like to start to, to delve into a little bit more about religions and understanding others' religions. Um, in this week's uh, session, in this week's uh, discussion. So maybe we can start out, um, Andrew, can you help us uh, start to understand why it's important for the public and for people to understand others' religions? Of course. So understanding other people's religions means getting a baseline religious literacy. And I like this word literacy because like any form of literacy, literacy is a skill that you can demonstrate. So let's use the example of a language, for example. You can learn the syntax and the grammar and the vocabulary of a language, but you, if you pick up a book and you haven't yet practiced or mastered that language, you're not literate. You don't know how to read that language. So in the same with, with religions, you can learn the basic tenets, the, 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 the essential texts and beliefs and practices of religion, but understanding another person's religion means being able to put that into practice, and that, that means watching a movie and understanding the religious dimensions of that movie, or, or reading a, a news article and understanding the religious dimensions. So religion touches every aspect of culture, whether it's economics, society, uh, politics. So this is why I say we all need to have better religious literacy, especially in uh, the context where I teach, which is the United States, because we are a, the United States is a religiously diverse country where religious influences are in every corner of culture. And to flourish in a democracy like that, we need to have a baseline literacy, baseline understanding of each other's worldviews. I want to add something to Andrew's uh, words. Um, I think religion is uh, the base of civilizations. Uh, when we speak about words, civilizations, uh, when we think about uh, the, civil the civilizations that uh, Samuel H Huntington included in his uh, research about clash of civilizations, those civilizations, basically, almost all of them are connected to religions. Uh, we have the Muslim civilization, we have the Indian civilization, we have the, the Chinese civilization, uh, we have the Western civilization, which is connected, of course, to Christianity. Um, so um, we so when we want to learn and to understand uh, the great civilizations of humanity, we should uh, uh, first of all learn about the, the most important religions of humanity, which are, of course, uh, the three monotheistic uh, religions, uh, uh, Christianity, uh, Islam, and Judaism, and of course, uh, uh, religion.
religions, which include uh, hundreds of millions of believers, like the, the Hinduist and the Buddhist uh, 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 religions. So um, to, to learn about religions is really to, uh, to uh, understand humanity in its base. And uh, uh, the, the, the terms of religions are the terms of uh, life and death, the, to understand the relationship between uh, uh, human beings and the universe. So these are all the, the issues that uh, all religions deal with. So we should l learn about religions to understand how humanity and the, the, the various perspectives in which humanity looks upon life. You know, one thing that's always sort of struck me when uh, we talk about learning about others' religions is the fact that from a person who grows up within a religion, it, you know, it's pretty normal. It makes sense. It doesn't really strike you as particularly odd. But when you're, a person is exposed to a religion that they know very little about, you know, it can sound, you know, fantastical. It can, found, it can sound, you know, completely out of the, you know, out of the blue. So how does a person with you know relatively little exposure to somebody else's religion start to get to a point where they can eventually not just uh understand the other person's religion but even uh respect it and appreciate it well, i think i think uh the base thing is is connected to what i said before uh when you look upon religion as a strong uh, pillar of civilization of culture, you should uh, um, not uh, understand religion uh, only by its uh, uh, commitments, by commandments, but to learn what sort of philosophy, what sort of human's perspective this religion has uh, uh, to say about, about the world. And so when you look upon uh, Jewish uh, commandments, uh, you should you should ask yourself what is the perspective of Judaism when you look upon a Christ Christian or Muslim or any other religion ask yourself the base questions what this religion say about the world about humanity about co the connection between uh, human beings and the universe and, and about nature etc etc so I think these are questions that uh, any human being uh, um, should ask himself or herself. So if this is the question, is if this is the perspective, even a very secular or atheistic person can, uh, uh, can uh, connect themselves to the questions of religion. The way I'd answer your question, Mike, is to, to know the, the fundamental difference between a devotional study of religion and an academic study of religion. So I, I'm getting my PhD in a religious studies department. And religious studies is a secular, non-sectarian study of religion. We study religion through the lenses of ar archaeology, anthropology, sociology. So someone that is raised in a religious community and who might view other people's religions or non-religious perspectives as, as weird or different doesn't necessarily preclude them from studying another person's religion from an academic perspective. So I, I like to use the example, uh, an analogy of two fish swimming in the ocean. And one fish swims by and says, hey, how's the water? And the other fish says, what's water? Mm -hmm. So that fish's inability to know that they're swimming in water is similar to someone who's raised in a religious community and doesn't realize that their perspective, their religious community is one lens and that there are multiple lenses from different, that different communities have their own lenses, their own perspectives. So it does require a bit of empathy. It requires um, a, a level of recognition of another person's perspective, that, that, that their perspective is not necessarily normative. It's one uh, authentic claim to what reality is like and that there are other legitimate authentic claims to universal truth uh, between religious communities and non-religious communities. So I, I also often say that you don't need to be religious to study religion. Um, there, there are many scholars that don't have religious commitments in the, the field of religious studies. Uh, the term itself, religious studies, is confusing. It has that word religious in it. It just means that we're studying religion as an aspect of human culture. 
And that's an aspect that's embedded in all different corners of culture. I appreciate what Yair, Yair said about uh, studying different civilizations and how religion is fundamental in some respects to different civilizations. How can you understand the Indian subcontinent without studying Buddhism, Sikhism, or Hinduism? How can you understand Japanese culture without studying Shintoism? We're studying the Middle East without understanding Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. So it, it does require a, a, a level of empathy to realize that this is um, a different as that there are different aspects, um, different perspectives between religious communities. You know, one thing that uh, we're, we're talking a little bit about in terms of sharing with others and in terms of educating others you know, one thing that we, we haven't really gotten to yet is how do you educate other people about religion? How do you educate the public about religion? Is this something that you could do in a, in a public education context? Can you, can you teach children, for example, about religion in school, in a public school? Um, and if so, how do you do that in a way that respects others, educates others, and at the same time does not infringe on anyone's beliefs or anyone's religious freedom. I can only speak to the, uh, the American context. Um, we, we, like, we want to be careful with our language. I don't want to say we should teach religion in a public school. I say we should teach about religion in a public school. And that's, that's a tough uh, a needle to thread sometimes because religion is uh, deeply tied to people's identity. It, it can raise really... Um, uh, strong emotions and, and debates. So there's multiple ways you can go about doing that. You can you can implement a strong religious studies angle in a world history course. So I just spoke about you know, understanding Japan by studying Shintoism. So if you're a world history teacher in a public school, I think that you should be trained in religious studies to some level. So when you do teach about the Indian subcontinent or when you do teach about uh, Europe or the Middle East. You also can talk about the religious dimension in each of these cultures. Um, some, some schools have uh, experimented with dedicated world religions or comparative religion courses. So there's a famous case in Modesto, California, where the Modesto School District implemented a religious studies, world religions course as a required course for all of their graduates. Uh, and it's been a success. Students entered the course, um, it, studies found that students didn't change their religious identity through the course. There was concern from the parents that the students might be deconverted out of their religion, out of their religion from the class. But that didn't happen. Students remained in their religious identity, but what did happen was a greater respect for their colleagues' own religious, uh, religious freedom and religious perspective. So there, there has been some evidence to show that an academic study of religion in a public school setting can help improve <laughs> students' respect for the uh, First Amendment freedoms of the establishment of religion and uh, freedom to practice religion. I, I will say there's debates on when to implement these classes. I personally think uh, elementary school students might be too young uh, this this oh, this course at Modesto, California, is a high school course, for example. Uh, so there there is a debate to be had when to implement a course like this, and whether it should just be its own dedicated world religions course or implement it into a world history course. Um, I personally think a high school is a good time to introduce that. Um, but you know, let's let's stick with the American uh, context for yeah. just one extra minute, and then we'll turn to the Israeli context. Um, so in the American context, a lot of people I think are not aware around the world that the United States federal government does not run uh, public sector education uh, in for primaries and secondary schools, but instead that's at the state level. So are there already examples in the United States um, besides the Modesto you know, sort of experiment that you mentioned, um, but are there other examples where uh, uh, or certain states or certain localities have actually implemented uh, religious uh, education, or I should say, as you said, education about religion uh, in their uh, public school programs? I can't think of many specific examples. Modesto is the one example where it's a required course. Um, as far as I know, when there is a world religions or comparative religion course in a public high school, it's usually an elective. Uh, unfortunately, what, what we hear most is schools that, that 
fail to live up to a constitutionally rigorous course, where they, they will teach a Bible course, for example, from a devotional perspective that endorses uh, a Christian perspective as opposed to remaining as objective and neutral as possible. Uh, there was a recent court case in West Virginia where this was a case where a, a, a Christian, evangelical Christian Bible course was essentially being taught in a public school. Um, so it's, I'm not going to lie and pretend that it's an easy ask. I feel like it's a tough field to teach, and teachers that want to be more rigorous with their religious studies education should also be aware of the constitutionality of these classes. Um, so that, yeah, a lot of a lot of cases would happen where where a teacher's not permitted to to lead uh, prayer in class, for example. They're not they're not permitted to endorse nor um, inhibit the, the practice of religion in their classrooms. So a religious studies course could easily um, swerve into a unconstitutional into unconstitutional waters if, it, if it's not well taught. If the if the teacher is not trained in both the religious freedom law and the religious studies content. Mm, great, thank you. Yeah, what about in Israel? How the uh, how's Public in public schools, how is religion taught, and, and what kind of contentious issues have come up here? Yeah. Well, first I want to uh, um, answer about the general question of, of uh, uh, religious studies. I agree and accept uh, Andrew's definition that when we speak about uh, uh, religion, religious studies, we should speak really not about teach uh, religion, but to teach about religion, because uh, among our students, of course, there are secular and atheistic uh, students and you can't uh, enforce them to to uh, uh, to learn a religion which they don't believe but because religion is as we said uh, the base of uh, civilization the base uh, very important base of of, uh, of, uh, of human uh, humanities cultures of course they should learn about uh, religions especially about their their own cultures uh, uh, religion um, like Christianity in, in uh, Western countries, like uh, Judaism in, in Israel, the Jewish state, like uh, Islam in Islamic states, etc. Um, but they also should learn, uh, especially when people come to the age of, uh, of uh, high school and, uh, of course, university or college, uh, they should learn also about other religions, uh, especially other religions that are uh, uh, in their own uh, state, and also other other religions which are the base, the, the most important religions in the world. Uh, in Israel, um, it's different than, you know, of course, the, the United States because in Israel there is no separation between uh, religion and state. So, uh, in uh, the aim of the public states, or one of the aims of the public of the public. Uh, uh, schools in Israel is to teach uh, uh, Judaism when you speak about uh, 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 schools in the Jewish neighborhoods or uh, to teach the, the Arabic uh, culture which includes of course Islam or Christianity when you speak about uh, um, um, Arab towns so um, so um, in, in, in these towns of course uh, people should uh, should learn about uh, uh, Judaism and also learn about uh, Jewish practice. I know that many uh, uh, secular parents are very much uh, suspicious about uh, uh, um, uh, teaching about uh, uh, Judaic uh, or Jewish uh, um, customs because they are afraid that when you speak not about philosophy or, or uh, Jewish history, but you speak about customs, then you really teach them religion. But I don't think so. I think that uh, every religion, especially uh, uh, Judaism, which is a very practical uh, religion, um, has, has its own uh, customs. And when you want to learn about the religion, you also, you also should uh, learn about its customs, at least its main customs. And it doesn't mean that uh, the uh, the school uh, uh, leads you, or tries to lead you, or tries to convince you to, to accept that, or to, to uh, uh, 
and to keep that, uh, that customs. Uh, but just to learn about those customs, which is based of your, of your uh, culture. So I think that um, um, when, you, when we speak about customs, uh, practical customs, uh, we can start it even in the very uh, elementary uh, age, like in elementary, like in elementary school, schools, or also in kindergartens. And in reality, there are kinder, kindergartens in Israel uh, which uh, teach their, their their kids about uh, the customs of Hanukkah or the customs of Passover, etc., etc. So, so, and and the kids uh, uh, identify themselves with those uh, songs or. Or uh, uh, or foods or or or, or uh, uh, some other customs uh, uh, which uh, connected to to any holiday. So I think that when you speak about practical customs, you should you should you can you can maybe you don't choose, but you can make it it also in elementary schools or in kindergartens. And when you speak about the ideas of religion, uh, you should learn it, especially your own cultures, religion. You should learn it in high schools. And in uh, should also learn about other religions. It's like example, like like in Israel, I think we should learn every uh, Jewish school should teach about Islam and Christianity because we have Muslim and Christians in Israel, and also of course uh, uh, the minorities, the Christians and the, and Muslims also sh also should learn about Judaism, so people can understand and know each other. And is there any difference when we're talking about uh, educating students, children particularly, about religion? Is there any difference in terms of religious freedom or let's say the acceptability in a public school context? Any difference between a, you know, their, their regular teacher who's teaching them versus bringing in a, 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 um, a religious a clergy member from another religion or from even from their own religion to to teach the students, you know, this is this is about you know our religion, this is about our religious holiday. Is there any difference in terms of what's acceptable and what's not? You, you mean about Israel? In Israel, in Israel yeah. yes. Well I think that of course the best option is that uh, secular teachers will teach in secular schools and religious teachers will teach in religious schools. So the 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 students can identify with them, but we also have a problem that there are not enough uh, secular teachers who know much uh, about uh, 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 Judaism in secular uh, 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 educational system. So because of that, um, we should uh, teach the teachers, first of all, and, and I know for example, the Hartman Institute is uh, expert uh, in in these uh, in these targets to to teach the secular teachers how uh, uh, to teach Judaism in a secular way as as a culture and not as a religion. Um, but um, the, also we can we can have the option which is not the ideal. It's not uh, it's not optimistic. But when we don't have enough teachers, we can take some religious teachers. But we should uh, uh, keep uh, and, and, and stand about the idea that uh, they, uh, those, those teachers should be liberal ones, religious liberal ones, and won't start to, to convince the children about uh, the, necess the necessity of religion and, uh, and speak about it as, as, as commitments, but also they should even as religious people or religious teachers by themselves, they should teach Judaism in secular schools like they were secular people, like it is a culture and not as a commitment. Mm -hmm. So, the, yeah, go ahead. Well, I can speak to the American context, and at least the Religious Freedom Center for whom I work with. Um, it's usually discouraged to bring in a rabbi or a pastor or, or an imam to, to teach as an expert unless that pastor has also been trained to teach Christianity from an academic perspective. And, that, and that's because, so for example, an evangelical pastor brought into a public school to teach a Christianity lecture 
that that pastor might be very well versed in their tradition if they were raised or if they're a Baptist pastor, they might be very well versed in the Baptist tradition. But could that pastor also teach about Catholicism? Could that pastor also be an expert on Greek Orthodoxy, for example? Because Christianity, all religions are extremely diverse. And it's it's a bit of a, a fallacy to assume that because you are a religious leader, you are also an expert on the totality of your religion. So at least the Religious Freedom Center and the Religious Literacy Project at Harvard University, we generally discourage bringing in a religious leader as an expert, unless that religious leader is indeed an expert who has studied the, the full religion. There's nothing inherently wrong, though, bringing a pastor or a rabbi in as a, as a speaker if the teacher or the school uh, couches it in the language of here is a leader of this particular particular tradition and they're going to speak from their perspective and the the pastor or imam or rabbi is not not used as an example of the totality of the religion the same could be said about calling on a student to to represent their entire tradition so for example if you're living in a christian majority state in the united states and you have one or two jewish students in the classroom it would be unfair for the teacher to call on that one Jewish student to say, what do Jews believe about this one this one issue? Because that puts the student in the unfair position of being the representative of their, their entire religion. So both in that situation and in the situation of bringing in a religious leader as an instructor, it's, it's problematic and it needs to be uh, explained in a certain way and contextualized by the teacher uh, before that, that is is. Um, implemented in the classroom. Right. I think that's a great point. Uh, you know, certainly in regards to the three uh, Abrahamic faiths that we see mostly here in Israel, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, within each of those, there are so many, so many diverse uh, traditions and factions and sects that, uh, you know, certainly one person could not represent all of them unless they were, uh, you know, as you said, an expert in an academic sense. Um, <clears throat> and you mentioned uh, a couple times religious literacy. Let's let's get to that. Let's let's unpack that a little bit. What is religious literacy and why is it important? Yeah, so religious literacy is there's two parts. The first part is having a baseline understanding of a few religions. So the baseline understanding would be a baseline understanding of the history, the the general beliefs and practices, and uh, the cultures surrounding these religions. So I don't expect a single person to be an expert on every single major world religion. That's just impossible. There's not enough time in the day to do that. But having having baseline knowledge of a few religions and their histories, their, their central texts, their basic beliefs and practices. And the second part of that would be uh, having the ability to discern the, the religious dimensions of different arenas of culture. So economics, politics, uh, art, because like I said earlier, religious literacy, literacy is a skill. You can learn all of the vocabulary about Islam and Judaism and Christianity, but if you can't apply that vocabulary, if you can't understand the religious dimensions behind, for example, the 2016 presidential election in the United States, where there were religious uh, actors at work, religious influences at work in that presidential election, then you're, you're, the knowledge that you learned from the textbook is not really useful. You're not religiously literate. So it's both the baseline knowledge and the application of that knowledge to di discern different dimensions of religious influence. Uh, another, another factor of, of religious literacy is understanding certain basic assumptions about religion. And these are assumptions that have been developed by Dr. Diane Moore at the Harvard Religious Literacy Project and Harvard University which is number one, understanding that religions are internally diverse. And we just mentioned this, how a single religion like Christianity not only has major uh, delineations like <laughs> Protestants and Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, but also massive diversity within these broader uh, categories and even on a local level. So a single American evangelical church might have a bunch of diversity within that very church uh, the Pew Research Center in Washington, D.C. just uh, did a study that showed that 19% of American evangelicals believe in reincarnation, which is interesting. Reincarnation is not part of historical orthodoxy in, Christ in Christian teaching, but yet there's that diversity within uh, American evangelicalism. So 
just just studying the basic general tenets of Christianity would miss that diversity in American Christianity. So that's number one, understanding that religions are internally diverse. Number two is understanding that religions change over time. They're not a historical and static traditions. So the Christianity of the first century when Jesus was first teaching is a very different cultural context from 21st century American Christianity or 21st century Coptic Christianity in Egypt. So understanding that religions change and that the rituals change, the teachings change in, the, in their, their um, expression and manifestation over the course of hundreds and hundreds of years. And the third component of, of religious literacy is understanding that re religions are embedded in all aspects of culture. And I've said this before, uh, you'll see religious influences in art, in politics, in business. And being religiously literate means recognizing those religious influences in different arenas of culture. So someone might say, oh, that's political Islam or that's political Christianity. And I would say, where's the difference between politics and religion? Because religion is embedded in politics. It's embedded in culture and society. So those are three basic assumptions about religious literacy, that religions are diverse, they change over time, which means they're, they, they have a history, and that they have, that they're embedded in different parts of culture. You can't separate religion out from its cultural context. Yeah. Well, um, I think basically uh, uh, religious uh, literacy means um, to know the, uh, the most important uh, principles of, uh, of that religion and the way this religion see it. Uh, not as you as academic uh, think that these are the, 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 the principles of, the, of this religion, but how the, the, the uh, religious leaders themselves see uh, this religion and, and see the, uh, its, uh, its principles, its main, its most important principles. Uh, and to understand that is the base of understanding religion. Um, second uh, uh, level is to, to, uh, um, to com the ability to compare between religions. Uh, especially about uh, um, um, the main um, terms of origins, what those religions say about God, how they uh, understand God, how each of them understand God, to, to, uh, the ability to compare between them, uh, what are the commitments of human beings towards God, um, what is most important for that religion, uh, as compared to the other religion, um, Islam to Judaism or to Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, Shintoism, etc. Um, so I think that comparison is very much important to understand not only the details but to understand the uh, the great the great picture of of every religion and the the religious phenomena in general. And and this, the third level is, uh, as Andrew said, to understand the changing, uh, the changes uh, uh, of religions, uh, not, uh, not only in history, it's important also, of course, to understand the, thing, the changes uh, in history, but also to understand why those changes uh, um, um, occurred. Uh, and to understand the, the importance of history and sociology upon the development of religions, because usually re uh, religions uh, describe themselves as uh, um, God's words, and that means that uh, uh, um, that means the assumption that the religion is not changed because the, the words of God is not changed. But in reality, of course, we see that uh, religions also have been changed. So we should understand that although religions uh, uh, connect themselves to God's words, uh, that their development is connected to human beings, uh, history and sociology. And that is also and that is very important to understand history and also very important to understand current developments among, uh, among religions. For example, in Judaism or in Israel, uh, um, there is a gap uh, between what the ultra-orthodox rabbis say 
about uh, using internet and using uh, uh, the most modern, the 21st uh, uh, century uh, gadgets and, and technology, and what the, the, what the uh, uh, ultra-orthodox community is really doing. So we, we should understand what is, the, um, what is the gap, and also to understand the source of the gap. So because of, if we understand the sociology, we can have the option to assume what will be the social developments of it. So I think also this is very important. Mm. You know, both of you have touched on, <coughs> um, at various points, the connection between politics and religion. Um, before we get to the, to the specifics of that in American and Israeli contexts, uh, let's expand a little bit about what does it mean, what's the connection between, you know, Amer United States and Israel obviously are both democracies. So what's the connection between democracy and religious freedom? Uh, to what extent is there, you know, democracy, of course, you know, the, the most fundamental tenet of democracy means majority rules. So where does, uh, where does religious minorities and, and religious majorities, for that matter, where do those come in to, uh, to the democratic space? Well, democracy is not only, of course, uh, uh, the majority rules, because um, this is the, the very um, technical meaning of, of democracy. It's, it's important, of course, that the, the majority rule. But uh, we can't understand democracy, at least uh, Western democracies, without a, a, the liberal uh, a pillar of democracy, which means this is not only the, the, uh, the majority rules, but it's important that the, the, uh, also to, to, uh, to have the, uh, those decisions, those rules, um, being liberal, uh, accepting and having uh, the freedom of, uh, as much freedom as a person can get, you know, the freedom of speech, freedom of, of, a, of, a, a, of work, and also, of course, freedom of religion. That, of course, then, uh, uh, doesn't say that we have uh, the, the uh, religious freedom as an absolute value, because every uh, democratic value and every value in, in humanity's life is not an absolute value. We should also, uh, we should always uh, uh, balance between values and the, the, uh, the freedom, uh, the religious freedom of, uh, of one can be the disaster of the other. For example, if uh, uh, in uh, Muslim countries or some Muslim countries, some Muslim uh, 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 customs uh, and, and tribes, there is a, a, the, the, the custom that uh, uh, if a woman uh, uh, is not obeying the, the, uh, the rules of, a, of, a, um, of, of a, a wedding and, and she, she, she makes love with, with a man without wedding, uh, uh, the, ma the man from uh, her uh, a family can kill her. Of course, we can't accept that that idea because of uh, uh, religious freedom. So we we always have to balance uh, uh, um, religious freedom as any other freedom with other freedoms, like of course freedom of life. Well, it's a good question, Mike. Um, it's and like Yair says, like religious freedom is not an absolute freedom. Like there's always going to be limits to it. So. In the United States Bill of Rights, it's it's phrased as an absolute freedom that Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion or stop the free practice of it. But we can use an example from the late 1980s. There was a religious community, uh, Santeria, which is an African Caribbean religion, wanted to practice animal sacrifice in this one Florida city. Uh, and the Florida city said, no, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to sacrifice chickens, even though that is part of your religious practice. And it went all the way up to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court said, no, this is their freedom of religion to, to sacrifice this animal. But there was a limit, there was a limit placed on that freedom, which was you must still abide by the Humane Sacrifice of Animals Act, which, which stipulates how you can kill an animal humanely. So even this absolute freedom of course, has limits. Uh, going back to the, the idea of democracy, where does democracy fit in all of this? Um, there's several components to it. You can't. There, there can't be a situation where a, a majority, the majority rule oppresses or or inhibits the freedom of religious minorities. And this is where the 
the First Amendment and the U.S. Bill of Rights comes in, where it protects individuals from practicing their religion. The individual, in, in and of itself, is the smallest minority. The religion, sh the the individual, should be enabled to practice their their religion. Um, so it's not so much majority rule stifling religious minorities. It should be a a mutual respect between both. A religious majority and religious minorities, so there can be a flourishing, you know, the flourishing in a pluralistic society. The United States is increasingly a religiously diverse nation. No single religious denomination has a majority anymore. Christianity is still the major religion, but if you break it down by denomination, there's no one denomination that has over 50%. So in a, in a sense, it's a nation of religious minorities, and we have to learn how to respect each other, how to flourish together as a democracy. And I think religious freedom is is a foundational, it's a basis for that, where, where respect between religious minorities has to be fostered, uh, so we can pull in the same direction of, of flourishing. And what about, you know, the, the, uh, some of the more contentious things that we hear in the United States, is regarding, for example, the, the use of religious symbols and religious uh, uh, practices in the public sphere, in the public space, um, on government property, for example. Uh, so to what extent does a majority religion or even majority historical religion in the United States case, even if it's not a current majority, let's say, um, you know, to what extent does that infringe on uh, religious freedom, or does it, or maybe it doesn't at all? Yeah, I mean, this is... It's it's a contentious issue, obviously. I mean, the, the first half of the, the Religious Freedom Clause in the Bill of Rights is that Congress shall make no law uh, respecting the establishment of a religion. So the, the so-called Establishment Clause can be interpreted as simply saying that the United States government cannot create a, a state church or a national religion of any sort. In more recent years, it's been interpreted as the, the U.S. government cannot endorse or appear to endorse a particular religion over another religion. So this is where the religious symbols, you know, maybe having a cross or a crucifix in a public high school has been interpreted as a breach of religious freedom because it's, it's a government institution endorsing or seeming to endorse one religion over another. Um, But that's, it, 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 it's different from for a, a student in, in that same public school from exercising their own religion. Though. There's, a, there's a myth that the student is not allowed to pray in, in, in a public school, and that's, that's just not true. A student still has their First Amendment rights. They can practice their religion. They can even uh, hand out literature about their religion if maybe they're an evangelical Christian that's trying to evangelize. But that's different from the government institution seemingly endorsing a particular perspective. Mm -hmm. And Nair, what about in Israel? I mean, you mentioned earlier the fact that uh, Jewish symbols uh, and and Jewish practice and certain Jewish customs, you said you, you said it sometimes could be considered uh, you know religious and sometimes national. Or uh, so how how does in, in Israel how does that uh, how does that shake out in the in the political and uh, context and public space uh, in government? Um, you know, we see Jewish religious symbols in, in many places. At least from the from the American perspective, we would see it and we'd say that's a Jewish symbol. Um, in Israel, do they see it the same way? Is it is it contentious here, like it like in the United States sometimes? Yeah, well, of course there are conflicts, um, and uh, there are conflicts. With, um, uh, because of the two main camps, the religious and the secular, are much frightened of each other. Um, the religious, uh, especially ultra-orthodox, are frightened because they see that the uh, public sphere is much more uh, liberal and secular than it was. Uh, for example, the, the status of uh, uh, gay and lesbian, the, the, uh, uh, the, the character of the... Uh, um, advertising uh, in the industry, uh, the uh, um, the uh, many many shops are open now on Shabbat uh, and etc. etc. So the, the the religious are frightened because they see the, the more uh, open and liberal uh, 
uh, uh, public sphere, the, really, uh, the, the secular, are frightened because they see the growing uh, part or the growing power of religious in, in politics. Uh, they see that uh, uh, in, the in the political sphere, the number of religious uh, uh, parliament members uh, is growing almost every, every, in every term. So because of that, the, the secular are frightened. Because of that, there are a lot of conflicts uh, uh, about Shabbat, especially about, uh, about uh, uh, kosher food uh, uh, and um, uh, and uh, I think, and also about about Judaic uh, studies, because also many secular parents are afraid that because uh, the Ministry of Education is controlled by religious uh, minister Naftali Bennett, so uh, they are afraid that uh, this will be used to um, um, uh, to religious propaganda in secular uh, schools, and there are some examples that. Uh, 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 some organizations, some orthodox organizations, uh, got permission from the uh, Ministry of Education to teach uh, uh, Judaism in secular schools in a way which is not uh, uh, um, um, in, which is not appropriate to the uh, secular values and secular ideology. So uh, the the both secular and religious have. Uh, have reasons to be afraid from the future, um, and because of that, the, this is uh, uh, we have many conflicts. And the other reason we have now many conflicts is that uh, at the beginning of the state, uh, uh, some years before the establishment of the state in 1948, and even some decades after the establishment of the state, the the atmosphere in Israel was a very collective one. Um, people. Uh, uh, um, people agreed to uh, to uh, concede uh, on their uh, private uh, rights, some private rights, uh, uh, in favor of the collective uh, uh, interest. And one of the, uh, those concedes were was that uh, uh, even secular politicians and secular people uh, agreed to, although they were the majority, uh, and at the beginning of the day, they, they were very strong majority. Um, uh, they agreed to concede in some way to the to the religious minority, um, uh, be, uh, just because to, uh, to have a, a, um, a national agreement uh, between uh, those camps. And we know that uh, Ben Gurion, the, our first prime minister, even one year before this, the establishment of the state, 1947, he agreed uh, to let the, uh, the he, he wrote a letter to the, uh, um, to the ultra-Orthodox leaders in which he said what will be the, 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 the religious concedes uh, that he will uh, do if he will, uh, uh, will be elected. And one of them was that uh, uh, on Shabbat, the, uh, uh, the public, the, public uh, uh, um, the, the government officials and the, and the public uh, sphere will Will be closed, and uh, that the mar marriage and divorce will be upon orthodox uh, uh, customs and, and some other uh, concedes. Now uh, the atmosphere is much more individual, so uh, uh, many uh, secular people are not anymore uh, uh, agree to concede on their uh, uh, rights, on their uh, personal rights, in the favor of the. Um, of the collective agreement. Mm -hmm. So we have an, uh, another reason for the conflicts. Hmm. You know, yeah, let me follow up on one point that you mm -hmm. mentioned there. Um, you said that at the beginning of your remarks there, you said you, know, you referred to the two groups, the, the ultra-Orthodox and the seculars, both of them being afraid mm -hmm. of each other. Um, but there's, you know, the, there's a big group that we haven't mentioned yet, which is the, uh, the religious Zionists. Yeah. So how did they figure into the uh, to, the, to this dynamic of, you know, religionization or not of the public space um, and that, that discourse and that debate. Right. Um, the religious Zionists themselves are very much diverse. As we said before, that uh, uh, not only uh, relig religion itself is diverse to, to some sects, also the sects itself, uh, themselves are diverse. So this is very much true about religious Zionism. 
and because uh, it's very much complicated from, from its essence, because religious Zionism really uh, 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 moves between three uh, points. It's, it's really like a triangle. Uh, one point, uh, uh, one side is the, is the uh, religious uh, 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 side, and the, the second is the national or Zionist side, and the other is the modern liberal uh, uh, side. So they move between those sides, and of course there, there are problems. And so there are parts of religious Zionism which are very much close to the liberal secular perspective, and there are parts of the religious Zionist sector which are more close to the ultra-orthodox perspective. So many people think that there is no longer a, even, we can say, any, we can speak anymore about religious Zionist sector because it's so much diverse, it's, it's, no, it's not anymore a, 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 a a, div a, a sector which is divided from other sectors, but as I said before, some parts are clo more close to the secular liberal, and uh, other parts are close to the to the uh, ultra orthodox uh, uh, part. Um, and there, has, there is a, a very much uh, um, frag a, a, a many fragments uh, in the uh, within the the religious Zionist sector because of its complex complexity. I think this complexity is really a, a microcosmos of the Jewish modern uh, 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 identity because these three uh, points of, of identity are really the three points of identity of all Jewish modern uh, uh, life. Uh, the uh, traditional religious point, the, the national point, and the modern liberal point. So um, because it's, as I see it as a microcosmos, of course, this is the the most problematic sector, the most diverse uh, sector, and also the most interest uh, sector. Right, absolutely. Well, I think one thing I've learned so far is that the labels that we use are much more uh, complex and, and problematic than, than we sometimes uh, uh, give them credit for. Um, <clears throat> let's turn to talk a little bit about protection of religious minorities, because um, in every country that it seems like there's uh, generally there's there's protection uh, of religious minority countries that generally where, where the governments generally do respect religious freedom you then you have these societal attacks uh, on on occasion some which are often horrible which, I mean which are always horrible but but they're sometimes they're really extreme um, yeah, like we saw in uh, uh, in Pittsburgh and very recently in the United States so uh, why is it that sometimes societal actors, people, non-governmental actors, will uh, sometimes attack religious minorities in countries where generally you do have religious freedom and protection of religious minorities? Why does that happen? I mean, that's a really complicated issue. It's hard to, to parse it out in 10 minutes. Um, I think fundamentally it starts from, from fear and lack of understanding between these uh, religious communities, it's easier to dehumanize somebody that you don't understand and refuse to understand. So on one level, it is it is an education issue, but I don't want to pretend that education is going to fix all of our problems. Um, another, another way to, to, to uh, approach this issue would be um, through media, for example. So movies that portray Muslims, Jews, or Christians in a positive light, for example, could do a lot of good in, in bridging these gaps of understanding between communities. Uh, the scholar of religion, Reza Aslan, a few years ago said, he thinks the movie, The Big Sick with Camille Nanjiani, which, which fo focused on a Muslim family, did more for the public understanding about Islam in America than all of the courses on Islam in every college campus, because people watched that movie, they loved that movie, and it had Muslim characters uh, acting just normal as, as, a, as a normal family in the United States. So whether it's through media, whether it's through education, uh, there needs to be efforts to, to, to humanize these, the, the other, to understand other communities to help break down these, these barriers of fear and mis misunderstanding. Um, as for the, the more violent and severe uh, cases, I, I don't know. I'll be the first to say, I don't know. You know, I think education would be one one angle, uh, media would be another angle, but it's it's a. I don't think the 
the issue is intractable. There's, there's no, um, the violence is not guaranteed and peace is not guaranteed. It's something that needs to be worked for. And we can't just assume it's going, that the violence is inevitable because I think that is a defeatist mentality. Um, I think uh, the basic answer for your question, why there are attacks against, against religious minorities in liberal countries, I think that even in liberal countries, not every person is liberal. Uh, and there are non-liberal persons in, in liberal countries. And why they attack others? They attack because they are feel frightened from the values of those of this uh, um, of this uh, um, of this religion. For example, if if we take the the, exa the, the, the example of Pittsburgh, the attack in Pittsburgh, what was uh, the claim of the of the terrorist? He said that uh, uh, he wrote in, in his uh, um, Facebook account that um, that uh, he hated the Jews because the leaders of the Jews endorse the uh, the immigrants uh, to the United States, and he attacked them because a, a Jewish organization called Hayas. Uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, endorsed uh, and, uh, uh, the the immigrants, and because he, as an, uh, an American, Native American, uh, felt that uh, the, the the issue of immigrants is frightened, uh, frightening uh, the uh, his identity as an American uh, or his rights, uh, his economic rights, or something like that, and be because of that, the easiest way to attack uh, the endorsement to the immigrants was to attack the Jews, which is a minority who, who, who uh, uh, welcome, which welcomes the, the immigrants. It's, very, it's, most, it's easier to attack a minority who welcomes uh, uh, the, the immigrants than to, to attack a majority which welcomes the, the, the immigrants. So, uh, so he attacked the Jews. And you know, the, 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 the issue is that uh, if you are, if you, the Jews, are uh, uh, a minority in our country, in our country, as the terrorists say, it's not your country, it's our country. So uh, uh, behave like like guests, uh, and uh, you know, as guests, you should not endorse other people to my to my house. And because of that, he attacked them because of this philosophy. And I can say that uh, you know, uh, there was a, a famous le lecturer, a lecture of uh, Gershom Shalom, a very important uh, Jewish philosopher about. The relationship between Jews and Germans uh, all over the modern era, and he said a very important uh, uh, claim he, uh, that uh, the the, the uh, German nationalists hated more the the liberal Jews than the conservative Jews. Why? Because the liberal Jews, from their perspective, wanted a cosmopolitan ideology that uh, 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 an ideolo ideology which. Uh, uh, give them a, 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 um, a justification to to be part of the German of the German nation, to be part of uh, to assimilate in the German nationality. But the, the German nationalists were, were afraid that this cosmopolitan ideology will break the, the the roots of German nationality. So because of that, they hate, as Gershom Scholl said, they hate the, the liberal Jews more than the, the conservative Jews. So if you compare it to what is happening in the United States, some conservative, uh, uh, extreme conservative Americans, uh, uh, racist Americans, hate the Jews because this is a, a minority which endorse another minority to, 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 to come into the United States. And they, of course, uh, because they are against that, they are also against the Jews. And let me just clarify for our, for our viewers, and we're using the terms liberal and conservative, of course, we're using it in the more academic sense, where liberal uh, means protection of individual rights and liberties, which does not necessarily map on exactly to the common parlance of liberal of sort of the United States. Yeah. Um, so let's just finish on a, on a perhaps a more positive note. What, are, what would you say is the, the single most effective technique to promote tolerance of others' religions? What would you say? Well, there's no technique, but I think Education is, of course, the, the, the most important tool. And when you speak about education, I think the most important tool is to see yourself in the, in the, uh, um, um, in the place of the other. Um, and if you hate somebody uh, because of, uh, of his or her religion, ask yourself, how will 
do you we do you feel if somebody will hate you because of your uh, identity because of your religion and I think uh, when you ask to see yourself at the place of the other maybe of course it's not the the, the 100% uh, uh, solution but I think it's it's the most important tool uh, to to understand and to to uh, to help people uh, understand the problem of hating others. Yeah, and I would actually agree with that. I, you know, I'm an educator, so I believe in education, but I think that's the first step. I think the most effective way is to, to have empathy, so putting yourself in the place of the other, to understand the other, and realize that your own perspective is not universal, but one, one take on the world, one world view. And the, the next step would be personal connections. Like meeting people is one surefire way to understand that these that there's different perspectives and that can help break down stereotypes you might have about other religious communities. So as as powerful as education may be, I do think personal connection and empathy for other religious communities is is even more powerful. Great. Well, thank you both so much. It's been a real honor to host this discussion here at the American Center in Jerusalem with Andrew Henry and Yair Shelley. Uh, this has been a, a great second part to our series on religious freedom. And we look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.